Welcome to the afternoon session. Our uh, speaker is uh, Rahul Garg from ISR Bhopal. He was also a student of Tangavelu and he will talk on pseudo multipliers associated to Griffin operators. I think it's a small. You can fix it here also. Am I audible? Okay. Sure. Okay, so okay. Okay, so thank you, uh, organizers, for giving this opportunity to talk uh, here. Okay. And then speaking for I mean, like any event where we are honoring Tangavelu, and uh, I mean I think. Some things will be said uh, after four o'clock, but I mean there is no doubt about it that many of us have been uh, very privileged and I mean like tremendously proud to be associated with him. It's very difficult to say I mean how much impact he has had on many of us, and I think many of us got the shock after landing here that we'll not be meeting him personally, but I think life goes on. So uh, I'll be talking about this topic, uh, and in fact, thanks to Sion, he taught me this topic, and Sion learned multipliers or pseudo multipliers from Tangavelu during his PhD. So certainly, whatever we are doing somewhere, either we have directly learned or indirectly learned from him. So I'll now start uh, discussing about pseudo multipliers, uh, but before going to the uh, sort of uh, uh, the topic on uh, Grotian operators, let me give a brief introduction of the uh, subject uh, in the Euclidean spec. So uh, recall uh, the definition for a, a nice function f on Rn. We define its Fourier transform uh, by this. And we know that, uh, so this is classically known that any operator which is translation invariant on Rn I mean, this is actually given as a multiplier uh, uh, operator, and Joe Sarup spoke up on multiplier uh, uh, operators in the morning. It follows from Plancherel theorem that, so what one does is, so we look at Fourier transform, the usual definition, we take multiplication by some nice function, at least to start with bounded measurable function on Rn, and we multiply this function and we invert it back using Fourier inversion at least for uh, uh, CC infinity functions, the inversion makes sense, at least in the sense of L2 Rn. <coughs> it follows from Plancherel theorem that this operator is not only L2 bounded, but the necessary condition for this, and which is sufficient also, is that M is L infinity. And I think in all my last slides, I have been saying what whenever I speak about this topic, I mean, I, I really like when it was mentioned in Stein's book that pseudo differential operators, what I will define in the next slide, they may be viewed as almost translation invariant operators. So there are many, many regions to study those operators, but they are closely connected with uh, this formulation, and they turn out to be actually very close to this notion of being translation invariant as well. There are many other regions to study them. So uh, now formal definition, 
given a measurable function on Rn cross Rn, we define the pseudo differential operator in this manner. So now you see if x is not there, if my symbol function m is only depending on xi, that's exactly the operator tm that I was writing in the previous slide, where you multiply m xi f at xi and invert it back. But now we are creating the dependence of the symbol function m on the space variable x as well. Now that comes with some price. So merely taking the function m to be uh, L infinity measurable is insufficient to get boundedness on L to Rn. And it's not difficult to have many such examples which verify. I will be talking about more generality and there you will see, I mean, like this is obvious. Even if I will not be writing an exact example on the board, but forget about with L infinity expecting L2 with even more conditions on M, one will not be getting L2. So some very sort of robust conditions on L2 on the symbol function are required to get boundedness on L2, which is the beginning of when you are studying on uh, boundedness of such operators on general function spaces. You want to first start with uh, some understanding on L2 spaces to begin with. So, but so as I said, I mean like some sufficient conditions. So like in the morning uh, talk, first talk we saw. So, I mean, even if you remove one, that means you don't, you allow singularity. If you take many of the derivatives of the function in xi variable and you allow them to decay at infinity at the rate of uh, uh, sort of inverse polynomial, the number of derivatives that you take, you give that many uh, uh, sort of decay at infinity, then you do get your operator TM is bounded on LP for every P between one to infinity. And in uh, for particularly when you are talking about uh, pseudo multipliers or pseudo different pseudo symbols, it's very important to uh, disallow singularity at zero. There are examples where if you, even if you are taking this kind of decay condition at infinity, but are allowing uh, uh, growth at zero, then you don't get even the L2 boundedness. So th this is the notion that they use uh, homogeneous or non-homogeneous. So we are taking symbols which are hom non-homogeneous in nature. OK, so any function and even so what I'm mo demanding more is if I take a derivative in X variable, I don't demand any growth or decay. I just want boundedness. OK, so such uh, any function M which satisfies this property, one can check that they are. I mean the corresponding operator MXD pseudo differential operator is in fact a singular integral operator and one can apply the a general theory of singular integral operators to get boundedness on LP and weighted spaces. I mean, like whatever the general theory of singular integral operators we do understand and the type of boundedness on various function spaces uh, we know for multipliers, we can expect. And in fact, it turns out that it is true. One can prove uh, those kind of results even for the pseudo differential operators. OK, now the situation becomes uh, quite cumbersome, quite difficult if one relaxes this condition. So the discussion of today's talk that I want to raise is this is quite a sort of uh, good condition. The le so I'm demanding decay at infinity of this rate. If you give me lesser decay, then the situation is difficult. OK, so in general, so this will be my definition of various symbol classes. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take those symbol functions defined on Rn cross Rn. Not necessarily we will be demanding for all possible number of derivatives, but for sufficiently many. So let's not worry about the number of derivatives because we are not talking about sharpness in terms of assumptions in terms of number of derivatives. But what I'm demanding is this kind of S sigma rho delta condition demands that you give me initial prescribed decay. Sigma often is a negative number. Positive means you are allowing growth, which means hopefully no result. So you give me some prescribed uh, 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 decay to begin with, and each time you take a derivative in xi variable, you give me some decay of the type rho type. And typically rho should be less than or equal to one because rho equal to one is good enough, as we discussed on the last page. I mean, if you are taking one plus mod xi to the power minus mod alpha, you get all the possible uh, results. So one often takes what happens between zero to one when you are taking lesser decay. And also, can you give some growth in x variable of some order delta? Okay, with this what kind of boundedness is possible? So these are the general symbol classes and we will be looking at what are the possible uh, sort of conditions on sigma, rho and delta so that such symbols have some kind of boundedness on all LP or on specific LPs. <clears throat> so early works on, so let me just mention a few more uh, uh, sort of slides on L2 boundedness. So 
the result about so you don't give me any oops, you don't give me any uh, initial decay if you are starting with s0 rho delta type of uh, symbol so you are allowing some uh, decay in terms of number of derivatives and some growth in terms of number of derivatives in x variable and if your delta is less than rho then hormand proved that the operator mxd is l2 bounded and the missing picture of delta equal to rho was completed by calderon and velencourt in 1971 where he proved the exact result if you allow delta to be equal to rho one can see the inclusion right i mean if you are increasing delta then naturally your lower symbols are contained in upper symbols so one can at best ask what happens to delta equal to rho or delta exceeds rho when delta exceeds rho one needs more condition and i will not be talking about that but the boundary thing was delta equal to rho so the end result as zero rho rho was proved in the 71 paper which was like i think very important paper at that time and it continues to give motivation even today but i'll just say that this result immediately was important in the theory to prove many important uh, sort of standing questions in partial differential equations so this remarkable result has found enormous number of applications in the study of partial differential equations one particular i read i read in steins book and elsewhere also in so when uh, uh, nirenberg and travis had posed uh, uh, their uh, sort of uh, local solvability conjecture in 1970 and this result came in 71 and fefferman and beels uh, uh, used this result very crucially in 1973 and they made very sort of uh, uh, uh important development on this conjecture and among many ingredients knowing the boundedness of pseudo differential operators with symbol types half half was a very crucial step so the so basically their proof among many other important ingredients very crucially use the fact that the pseudo differential operators with symbol condition half half are l2 bounded so everything happened pretty much simultaneously the conjecture was posed in 70 71 this remarkable result came up and this was used in this outstanding manner i don't know much about uh, uh, sort of application parts i'll be not saying too much but one thing i can say i mean like it's very well known the theory of pseudo differential operators has originated and has worked for applications in partial differential equations of linear and non linear both types okay so uh, just to give the uh, uh, classical uh, references so in early 70s the same time when calderon velencourt theorem came fefferman wrote the early fundamental papers on lp boundedness talking about what are the sharp conditions on sigma so this is the result uh, that he proved you take delta just less than 1 minus a but i mean like now it's known that one can take delta equal to 1 minus a as well and if you look at so just treat it as s rho delta where i am writing rho in other notation 1 minus a and this prescribe beginning decay sigma to be minus na by 2 uh -oh. so then he proved that uh, if one starts with this kind of symbol condition then the operator extends boundedly not only on all lp but also on the end points l infinity bmo and h1 l1 and in fact uh, lp boundedness comes as just the interpolation of the dc so i mean basically i mean like in any such proofs one studies either h1 l1 or l infinity bmo one of the two and the other part comes from duality because it turns out that if you are working with such kind of smooth symbols then the dual is also the pseudo differential operator where the dual operator is also having the symbol conditions of same type so once you prove one of the two end point the other comes by duality and the uh, in between part is just the interpolation okay and in general what he proved was so this again comes as sort of the interpolation technique that if you are working with general sigma less than equal to 0 so this is you can consider as kind of the end point where you give n of negative minus na by 2 then you get all lps but in general you are if you are looking for the specific lp type boundedness results depending on which p you are working with you give oops okay i'm new to this so depending on which p you are starting with accordingly you look for the sigma and if you give me that much of sigma negative you get lp boundedness so like multiplier theorems so, so this this is very much resembling to the multiplier conditions of hormand hamilton type p specific multiplier theorems there is a vast literature on symbol calculus such as so so far i have not discussed anything about how many derivatives one really wants one when one is uh, discussing these results in the beginning in the definition itself i said n of smoothness for as many as 
alpha and beta number of derivatives. But there is a, a large sort of literature available where I mean various people have looked at what are the optimal condition on the number of derivatives that are required and also the analysis where one is not necessarily looking for. So I'll just quickly go back. When one relaxes this condition by asking that if we what happens if we have rough symbols in the sense if in X variable I do not have any kind of a smoothness. OK, maybe at best holder condition or maybe not even holder condition. What happens when in X variable you have roughness? OK, maybe L infinity type of boundedness, maybe LP type of conditions on the symbol. So there is again uh, interesting literature available on rough symbols. If time permits at the end, I'll just touch it in last couple of slides. This topic of rough symbols, but otherwise I want to continue with the type of work that Harmander developed. <clears throat> so going forward, so. Now when rho is positive, so if I'm looking at this kind of class. S sigma one minus rho delta, so if rho is positive, that means I'm not taking zero. If if rho is zero, then it is S sigma one delta. We are in Keldron Jimund setup. If I take rho to be positive, that means I am taking S sigma one minus rho delta, which is like a number less than one, right? So that means I am outside the rhyme of Calderon Zygmunt theory. So we are outside the rhyme of Calderon Zygmunt theory unless you are giving me initial decay to be too much. You see, I mean, if you recall when we study Calderon Zygmunt type operators and when we look at the symbols, we look at symbol and its various derivatives to be decaying at infinity of the type mod xi to the power minus mod alpha had you given me and suppose I need n number of derivatives, but if you do the cheating of giving me too many derivatives, too many too much decay the, in the beginning itself. And if you know that the number of derivatives are limited is good enough, then I don't require any more decay through various derivatives. So if you are giving me negative to compensate the less, but not too negative, then we are outside Calderon Zygmunt and the analysis becomes difficult. We have to look for then other tools but not the usual method of Calderon Zygmunt. So the kernels are more similar along the diagonal and they belong to something called strongly singular integral operators. So there is a sort of whole lot of uh, uh, collection of operators which are called strongly singular integral operators. So in some sense, the theory fits there. Of course, with the notion of pseudoness. So uh, again, Hirschman sort of was the first person who made major contribution to this uh, uh, theory of a strongly singular integral operators and then Wenger and then the later theory was developed by Pfefferman in 70s and then Pfefferman's Stein. So now concerning and uh, uh, the weighted boundedness. So so far I was discussing about LP boundedness. That was the work of Pfefferman and now then in mid 80s uh, Chanilo and Torchinsky uh, uh, gave this beautiful proof where they work with this kind of symbol class. Again, if you see. So I was saying minus n rho. You give me half decay minus n rho by two. OK, and this can be actually visualized if one sort of just writes down that condition on the derivative. If you take exactly nth derivative, you would see exactly nth derivative demands n times one minus rho by two. That is n but less n rho by 2. So I'm supplying that n rho by 2 which is missing in the initial. So it matches up to nth derivative with the mill in one condition or under condition. So if you give me just that much and for rest of the derivatives, you keep giving me every time 1 minus rho, 1 minus rho, 1 minus rho. Then it turns out that the operator is which was known to be bounded on LPR and it turns out it is also bounded on weighted spaces and these are Mackinhoff weights for P bigger than 2 and weights coming from P by 2. And if you increase the number of uh, if you increase the initial decay, one can actually improve it by going all the way to AP. It depends on between minus n rho by two minus n rho. If you keep giving me extra decay, initial decay, then you keep improving. So that was the thing which was done in 2012. You will see the uh, uh, it wasn't pretty late quite after this result. So Mikulowski, Rule and Stoback, they studied this problem by taking enough extra decay, doubling the initial decay, and they proved that the operator, pseudo differential operator, is bounded on LP. This time the uh, uh, range of P goes all the way between 1 to infinity, and the weights are coming from AP class. And one can then interpolate to see that between minus n rho by 
and minus n rho, you can write down the result with a p by r for r between one to two. So quite recently, uh, two years back in this paper, Beltran and Kladek, and this is one of the I mean, like in his PhD, Beltran studied this sort of I mean extended sort of this study by asking more concrete question because these are the times when sparse operators have come into picture and uh, a lot of questions are asked in terms of operators boundedness in terms of maximal functions of various types or sparse. So Beltran studied uh, this question in more generality and got better results in terms of domination by um, various maximal functions. And the work was more or less completed in this paper by Beltran and Laura Kladek, where they proved uh, uh, interesting sparse domination results for pseudo differential operators going further below. So in this we are taking a lot of decay here. We are taking only half of the decay. One can even ask if you are taking much lesser decay. If you are what if you are taking the sigma go to zero, then what kind of sparse domination results you get? There was no result before this known on weighted boundedness in this. Not only that did they prove weighted boundedness, they gave not the sharp results. These results are still not sharp, but they gave sparse domination results, taking the sigma to be all the way going to zero. And then getting various uh, dependencies on which LP spaces you are looking for. So naturally, so if I again restrict myself in these two setups and in between minus n rho by Q, where Q is between one to two. So Q equal to one is Mikulowski rule is back. Q equal to two is uh, Chanilo Torchinsky. Then the operator is bounded on from this work. It follows that you are on LP Rn Omega. With P bigger than Q and W coming for AP by Q. OK, so that covers this result and everything in between. All right, so now let's try to see uh, what happens when we are beyond Rn. So I'll just give some sort of uh, cases where uh, things have been studied well. On Heisenberg group, one of the early works is by Bahuri and his collaborator. So this is the reference. And on compact groups so in 2010, there is this nice book by Ruzaniski and Turunen, which was further developed for non-compact case on nilpotent Lie groups by Ruzaniski and Fisher. This is again a Berkhoser book. And on Hermit pseudo multiplier. So, so I'll just say that in these two references, I mean, like basically in the work of Ruzaniski, uh, they have looked at sort of the sort of the analog of pseudo differential operators. So by going into group setting, you have something called Rockland operator, which is sort of the model for uh, Laplacian, but they are not looking at necessarily the spectral sense. They are actually using group Fourier transform and defining symbols by group Fourier transform. They made the parallel analog of pseudo differential operator. That need not be the case in general, because if you are working with Lie groups, then you can make sense of group Fourier transform. But in general, when you are working on homogeneous spaces with self adjoint non negative operators, you would be looking at uh, the natural Laplacian or sub Laplacian. So, so, like for Laplacian or sub Laplacian, you have the theory which is sort of in relation with the spect uh, spectral multipliers. So, that would be the analog you would be making in general for uh, various homogeneous spaces and the attached uh, uh, self adjoint non negative operators. So, one such is Hermit operator. So on Hermit pseudo multipliers, the early work is in 1996 Epperson. So he uh, basically assumed L2 boundedness and proved LP weighted boundedness, assuming L2 boundedness. And then uh, during his PhD, Sion uh, uh, generalized the work of Epperson, which was done only for dimension one. They did it for higher dimension and also improved in the number of derivatives they assume. This time, once again, they had to assume L2 boundedness. And these are all non weighted. And very recently, uh, Fukin Lee and uh, Virginia Naibo, they have uh, uh, done a lot of work on Hermit pseudo multiplier. So I'm not explicitly defining what Hermit pseudo multiplier is, but maybe I'll define it on the board in a minute. <laughs> so, I mean, and Sion and I have written a paper last year, and we have uh, uh, basically proved uh, the missing L2 boundedness result, what we say is Caldron Velencourt theorem. We do not know the optimality, but for us, it's the right analog. So on homogeneous spaces in 2014, Bernicott and Frey wrote uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, the notion of pseudo differential operator for general class of self adjoint operators on uh, doubling metric major spaces. And this is something I want to write on board. It's like, what does one want to work with when one is leaving Rn? Okay. So yeah, I think this is the right line. So 
So recall that the Hermit operator is the positive Laplacian plus mod X square. And then we know explicitly that. So I should say 2K plus N. Explicit spectral resolution for Hermit operator is known. So generally one writes multiplier by just looking at one applies a function given function on the uh, uh, eigenvalues and one looks at one inverse in the sense of Fourier inversion and one defines the multiplier for very for such a given operator whose spectral resolution is explicitly known. And that motivates us to define the pseudo multiplier by demanding that the function is not only depending on the frequency variable, but is also a function of a space variable. So that's the meaning of Hermit pseudo multiplier for us is. And now this is well defined because you can always look at functions whose spectral uh, decomposition has only finitely many terms. So the series which looks like infinitely infinite series may not make sense, but on a dense space you have the sense. So the operator is well defined on dense space and then you can ask all questions L2 boundedness, LP boundedness and whatnot. So generally speaking also if you had some sort of abstract operator L and you had this self adjoint non negative operator and suppose you had the uh, doubling metric major space, you have a metric major space where the major is doubling. So that Some there is some positive D. Then one can ask this question. I mean, this condition is not necessary, but I am just restricting my job assuming this condition. This makes my life easier. Then one can ask. So we know if you give me a self adjoint non negative uh, uh, operator, I have its spectral resolution and by functional calculus, I can write right. And we again know that if you give me a function which is L infinity on the spectrum, then this operator is L2 bounded. Yeah. Now, this prescription does not allow me to go in abstractness the type I am doing here. Now, if I want to just mimic this process and I want to write. Now this may or may not have any sense. This is too abstract to write and pretty much I mean like the way we write. I, I am writing this definition has absolutely no meaning because I don't know what kind of spectral uh, resolution this operator has. What kind of spectral ma major that I have at hand? Is there any dense space where I can write this? That is the type I wanted to I, I said to motivate that this definition looks crazy, but this has sense because you can work. You can define it on a function f whose uh, Decomposition has only finitely many terms, and we know that these are dense in L2, right? So this had sense. So I can mimic this process at least for those operators where I have the sense of uh, sort of explicit knowledge of uh, spectral resolution. And if I also have this kind of formula whenever I dare to write, if I have at least a dense space where the formula makes sense, okay? So I will not get time to motivate this further, but there is a abstract notion where we can do this but maybe perhaps not with this but i'll not touch it okay so maybe with this motivation i'll go forward so now the topic was of grushin operator so this is the definition of grushin operator the the easiest uh, form of grushin operator and these are known to be uh, sub elliptic operators minus the Laplacian minus mod X square del T square. So this is defined on Rn plus one where I'm using X variable on Rn and T variable on last variable. So it's like Rn cross R. Now this can be written explicitly as the sum of squares with minus where the uh, 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 first order gradient vector fields are del Xj and Xj del T. OK, now this is the bracket generated. I mean, and this is the condition that tells me. I mean, I can use the Hormander's theorem to uh, which X immediately tells me that my operator is hyperelliptic. 
and one understands what the uh, control distance is associated with the Grotian operator and its uh, uh, sub-Riemannian geometry. So since I have the notion of vector fields, I can always talk about uh, uh, between two points. I can talk about geodesics and I can ask what is the uh, smallest uh, uh, sort of distance. So, so that in literature they call it as control distance. It's explicitly known. The asymptotics are very well known. So that's thanks to the work of Robinson and Sikora from 2008. Six or eight. So if I define using this Subramanian metric, if I define uh, the balls, and if I denote by mod bxr, turns out the Lebesgue measure is the uh, uh, measure here. So the Lebesgue measure of the ball has this explicit asymptote where you have growth of r to the power n plus one times maximum of r and x prime. So this is typo. I mean, okay. So if I write x as x prime comma t, so the first n variables are x prime, it depends on the x prime. So it's r to the power n plus 1 times maximum of r and mod x prime. So that is certainly bigger than or equal to r to the power n plus 2. So you see that homogeneous dimension is not n plus 1, but rather n plus 2. And if you take the usual dilation of uh, first variable dilated by r and the last variable derivative by uh, dilated by r square, then you actually see that the homogeneous dimension is n plus 2. Now this is something I wanted to write and wanted to highlight in whatever analysis that we do. This is explicit, so this is helpful, but this is also the obstruction. Knowing that the wall volume depends heavily on the center, so that's good enough. I mean, like, so this prescription tells me that I'm working in a doubling metric major space. This is same as like this, so that's good enough. But at the same time, knowing that the volume is depending on center makes the analysis very difficult, and that is not the case when you are working on Lie groups. When you are working on Lie groups, at least on Euclidean or Heisenberg group, the favorite ones, the ball volume is explicit. It's two sided R to the power homogeneous dimension. Now this dependence makes life difficult. So whatever I'm presenting today, actually it works for Heisenberg group and many other setups. Just for this extra difficulty, we prefer to present the work in this non Lie group setting on Grusian. The same methodology gives same answers for Lie groups of various types. If not, claiming too much, certainly for Heisenberg group and H type groups. OK, so uh, the spectral resolution is well known. So Grusian operator can be, I mean, like the spectral resolution is given by taking the Fourier transform in last variable. That basically makes it a scaled Hermit operator. So that's H lambda, F lambda, where F lambda for me is just the Fourier transform in last variable, inverse Fourier transform in last variable. So you do inverse Fourier transform in last variable, apply H lambda, invert it in the last variable, that's your Grusian operator. OK, knowing the explicit uh, spectral resolution of H lambda, we have the spectral resolution of G. So I, I just need to take the scaling of this by multiplying lambda square here. And the scale comes up in projection operators. So uh, if I denote by phi mu lambda, L2 normalized Hermit functions and PK lambda the scaled version of PKs. These are orthogonal projection onto eigenspace of eigenvalue 2k plus n mod lambda. We know that G has this expansion. So basically, I'm writing H lambda F lambda in this manner. PK lambda F lambda times 2k plus n mod lambda. And that tells us that what should be the uh, multiplier for Grusian. That's the function which you apply right here. M of 2k plus n mod lambda. So more generally, if I'm defining pseudo multiplier, I'll be taking a function which is defined on function space X and T. So X comma T is my notation. Sometime I think I'm doing che cheating. I'm using X as variable or sometime X comma T. Sorry about that. But so this is my space variable X comma T as R in cross R. And OK, so this is no, this is no typo. So this is the spectrum 2 mod mu plus n mod lambda. So you take a function M defined in this manner. And that's my. Uh, pseudo multiplier for Grusian. Again, well defined, as I said, I mean, like we can write it as long as we understand that there is, there is some sense of this infinite looking expansion. So there should be a sense of this integration and this infinite expansion. So if I can identify at least for L2 Rn plus one, if I can identify a dense space where this makes sense, then I'm happy at least to formally write it. That's the case. So one can look at all those functions where in the expansion of the function you have a uh, Hermit expansion of finite type and in lambda you take compactly supported such functions. It's easy to check that they are uh, dense and anytime you are looking at this kind of prescription, you have well defined this. So the operator makes sense. At least on a dense space of L2 of Rn plus one. So we start the questions.
of what makes what conditions are sufficient to have L2 boundedness and all. So if I write X to denote the vector fields of X1 up to Xn, X11 up to Xn1, and these are the same ones I think I wrote here. LXJs and XJ delta, I'm just collecting them together like gradient vector field. And our symbol in this manner. Now this instead of E sigma, I'm writing sigma by two. Instead of delta, I'm writing delta by two. And instead of rho, I am writing one plus rho by two. So I'm looking at a function of a space variable xt and spectral variable eta, and I'm looking at derivatives in eta and in space variable, right? If you recall the definition on Rn, it was like initial prescription sigma and then growth in a space variable of the type delta and the decay of the type rho. Now this difference comes up because Grushin is an operator of order two. When we wrote down the symbol condition for pseudo differential operator, it was corresponding to derivatives of one order. Now think of it, if you were working with a spectral multiplier of Laplacian, then you will want to make change. You will want to define a symbol mx xi equal to m tilde of x mod xi square. So once you make that relation and you write down your derivative condition on the other function, you will see that this is the natural condition for operator. This helps us to remove singularity at zero on one hand. Since I will not going into proofs, it is difficult to explain, but that also helps me to write down what I would do. So back there, I wrote the operator as mxd. If I was writing for a uh, spectral case, the question was, am I writing for Laplacian or minus the first order? So to avoid square root, I will be writing for mxh. Similarly, I will be writing for mxg. This is the right motion. OK, so that's what we start with. And uh, with Sion, we proved that missing the endpoint delta equal to rho with this condition, we have L2 boundedness. So we proved this result for Hermit multiplier, Hermit pseudo multiplier at the endpoint delta equal to rho as well. But in Grushin case, delta equal to rho is missing. Our techniques were insufficient. We had some singularity issues, but at least up to the endpoint, we have boundedness result. As I said, I mean, like we believe this is sharp in the sense of definition, but we still do not have explicit um, explanation to give. It's more of motivation. Okay, so to give what we prove, so now we will be taking conditions not of S0 rho delta, but rather of the type minus N1 minus rho or minus N1 minus rho by 2, which are the work of Mikulowski. Rule and Strobeck or Chanilo Torchensky. So that was the uh, main results that I wanted to just state at least to sort of explain that. Uh, let me actually skip. Let me just say one thing. So, it, okay, I'll not be saying much. I mean, there is there is this notion of a sparse family, eta sparse family. Okay, let me read it out if it is here anyway, because I'll be needing to say that once you have a sparse, then you have results. So we say, sorry, Amelie. Really. So there is a work of uh, Michael Christ, and often we co call these cubes to be Christ cubes. So if so, using Christ cubes notion, one can define a family of sparse. Uh, so what one does is, I mean, if you have a family of sets, which is eta sparse, which means that for every member in this family, there exists some part inside it, which is not too less. And at the same time, these small parts are pairwise disjoint. So that in some sense you can think of if you had that dyadic decomposition on R or Rn, you can do that. So that's a suitable sort of uh, uh, replacement of what you had as dyadic in Rn. For a sparse family S and R between 1 to infinity, excluding infinity, one defines this sparse operator by looking at averages, R Rth average of the function on the family Q in S and then summing it up with characteristic function each time on Q. Now, the abstract result that I want to quote here is that for P bigger than R, so if you are ever taking R sparse family and you give me P bigger than R and W in P by R, then these sparse operators have this weighted boundedness, which is sharp actually. At the label of sparse, you know that the weighted boundedness of ARS is with this condition. So this actually, this bracket W AP by R is the AP by R 
constant of the weight function. So with Makinov family, you define what is the least constant attached to in the definition of Makinov weights that we call as Makinov constant, some power of it. So the results are sharp, at least for a sparse family. And this is a common practice now in last decade to have some operators boundedness. If you are looking to prove, you, you try to see that if you can prove an abstract operator in an appropriate sense by some kind of a sparse family. And the moment you have that kind of pointwise or some similar type of average inequalities, using the boundedness of a sparse, you get the boundedness of the operator that you are studying at hand. OK, so that in some sense you can think many of the times in classical harmonic analysis, we try to see a given operator of some type like Caldron, Zygmunt and all. How is it dominated pointwise by maximal operator of some type? And the moment you get that, you have results known in terms of boundedness of maximal operator, you get for free for your operator. OK, so that's sort of the, let's say, advanced version of that philosophy. OK, so uh, in our analysis, we also uh, uh, look at the Pfefferman's, uh, Stein Pfefferman's grand maximal truncated operator, which is basically the truncation. You look at characteristic function outside a given ball. For a given ball, you look at, you blow it up, you look at outside, and you look at these averages, okay? And you look at the supremum. And the result that we crucially use, which was proved in 2021 by Lerner Ombresi in Euclidean, and it was extended by Lorist on homogeneous. Spaces. So every time I say something is homogeneous spaces, I mean a metric major space which is doubling. So in this kind of scenario, so what they proved a beautiful result. I mean, like so that says that if you give me a sublinear operator which is of weak type PP, and if you know that its uh, grand maximal truncated operator is of weak type QQ, where P and Q are some numbers bigger than or equal to one, less than infinity, not necessarily which is bigger, which is lower. Forget about S for a moment. This is technical. And if you write R to be the max of P and Q, what you get is point wise, you have a sparse family. It guarantees existence of a sparse family such that your operator is point wise dominated by this sparse family. Okay, for R, maximum of P or Q. So this abstract result immediately tells you that in order to have weighted boundedness of T with more information on the weights, it is it suffices to look at its grand truncated maximal operator. If you know that your operator was weak type at least somewhere, and if you are able to analyze the properties of its, its uh, uh, grand maximal truncated operator, you can uh, you can get this kind of sort of robust information at the level of actually pointwise itself. As an application, you get weighted boundedness, but you actually get on the face of it pointwise control. So that was basically, I mean, like, so the slides are a bit discrete in nature. I will not be going into proof, so there will be a, almost no place where you will see why this is important. But this was just to say that these are the crucial tools somewhere in the proof. Those are used. OK, so these are the results. So this, as I mentioned in the beginning, I hope I mentioned. Maybe I forgot. So with Sion, Avishek and uh, Riju, we, we did this work in last one or two years. So uh, this you would see is an. an so this is unweighted, and you would see that this is the type of a space that Mikulovsky and, and Rule and Stoback studied. So you look at S one minus rho delta and give me the decay of the type minus n rho. So this n is the homogeneous dimension here, n plus two, not the topological dimension. So if you give me this much, then we actually have H one L one boundedness. But then something that is not mentioned here is we are assuming L two boundedness. So we are assuming that. L2 boundedness is given, and then we prove that H1 L1 boundedness is there, and this comes for free interpolation. Okay. Now, if you rest, so this is true for delta less than or equal to one minus rho. If you take delta strictly less than one minus rho, then Sion and my work guarantees that it is certainly L2 boundedness, L2 bounded. We do believe that delta equal to one minus rho it is also. We have no proof, right? And then if you take spaces going all the way between minus q rho to minus q rho by 2, but not touching 2. In between, we have boundedness on LQ. OK. Of the same type Q. And then if you are assuming L2, you get everything between Q to 2 for free. So this you can consider as Q equal to 1. So and the main result which we actually built on these with the so these are so these are the Hardy spaces with respect to the Grushin operator. So there are various ways where you can define and Joe had uh, uh, 
in an earlier work with Jovanovsky, she has proved that you define it using maximal operator or the atomic. They are same. And on BMO side also, Jyoti, right? So they are the same. But so that de depends on generally, I mean, like when you write down Hardy space, it depends on what you mean by that Hardy space. You may be defining it by atoms or you may be defining it by one of the many types by, of either uh, using uh, square function or maximal function. In this particular case, it matches. Okay, and so these are results interesting in their own aspect, but building on them, we proved our main result. So you start with S sigma one minus a delta, and sigma can be something. Sigma we are taking something between minus q a to minus q a by two, but minus q a by two. We are unable to touch minus q a by two Chenillo type, but something in between. We have our result that for r bigger than q, if q was equal to one, you get r between one to infinity. Or otherwise, what is whatever is your decay given, you start from that and you have sparse domination. And as I mentioned, so once you have this result, then weighted boundedness is for free. OK. So so uh, A is anything between 0 to 1. If you take A equal to 0, so I'll, I'll come to delta. If A is 0, not much to do. The moment you give me 1, skeleton Jigmund. The moment you give me A equal to 1, problem. It is like no decay. So A has to be strictly between 0 and 1. Now delta is strictly less than uh, less than equal to 1 minus A. Assuming L2 boundedness. All these machinery assumes L2 boundedness to start with. None of the proofs uses the proof of proving L2 boundedness. So the proof, the fact that these are L2 boundedness is L2 bounded are used. At least when delta is less than one minus a, we have guarantee that it is L2 bounded. Otherwise, we just assume. Clear? So, I mean, classically, how does one prove such type of uh, multiplier or pseudo multiplier results? One breaks in a spectrum in dyadic. We do that. So, using some suitably chosen partition of unity, one breaks the multiplier into pieces, and the game is always to study the pieces. And then to sum it back. And then so I'll just say one slide again, a discrete slide at the next page, but with a purpose. So now studying these operators. So the main operator need not be a kernel operator, integral kernel operator. But the moment you take uh, kind of leaving the first zeroth case, every other case is like half to two, one to four, this kind of dyadics. If you take any such piece, then you can actually check that your operator is actually an integral kernel operator. So you can write down explicitly your integral kernel. OK, if I do not it by KJ X tilde Y tilde where notation has again changed another time. X tilde is X comma T, Y tilde is Y comma T. The results that we could prove were these so called weighted plancherel estimates and weighted plancherel estimate basically ask for these kernels which are corresponding to a symbol which was compactly supported. So you see, I mean, our symbol MJs are compactly supported in spectrum. So given a symbol of compact support, if you go to the kernel side, it's L2 norm and the action of distance function on it. How is it controlled by uh, basically functions, various uh, derivatives? So if I'm writing certain number of powers, that is corresponding to certain number of derivatives, and that's just hidden here. But we get this kind of boundedness. So this type of estimates are known particularly from the work of Duang, Ohabaj and Sikora from 2002 JFA paper. They wrote explicitly how to prove this using. So before that, a lot of uh, such results were known in specific cases of Lie groups and all, but they actually realize the moment you assume homogeneous condition, doubling metric major space, and if you assume that the heat kernel attached with the operator L has pointwise Gaussian of the Euclidean nature, then you actually have these estimates. Now we could basically verify that their result works for us. We could see that the proof works for us with, with absolute care, where the even if the symbol function is depending on the space variable, we have the same type of estimates. Now this without derivative is fine. The next object that comes up is we in our analysis, if you sort of unwrap the proof in Euclidean, you will see that these estimates are absolutely required in one way or the other. So not only that the kernels weighted estimates are required, its derivatives weighted estimates are also required. 
and that was the challenge. And this is just to say, why did we stick to Grushin operator, right? I said that we could we can do a little better for various types. The reason to stick to Grushin operator is also that in order to prove this, we go back to Duang Ohaba Sikura, where they demand that the heat kernel should satisfy Gaussian bounds. Now this time I require heat kernels. Derivatives should also satisfy. Now thanks to Grushin operators nat nature and the recent work of uh, uh, Jubaniski and Adam Sikora, we know that one can actually have a connection between Lie groups and Grushin operators of certain types, where we can actually use the uh, uh, knowledge of Lie groups and the heat kernels derivatives have Gaussian decay. We can actually come back and guarantee that in Grushin we do have the same. So using that, and for that purpose we restrict our attention to Grushin. But a lot of things can be said. Whatever I am saying for Lie groups also, at least in many of those setups where heat kernels derivatives have appropriate bounds. So we we could sort of use the proof of Duang Ohaba Sikora, and we wrote down the proof for derivatives in uh, uh, x variable, right? And similar estimates. So I mean, like one can just focus on this type. So that's what I wanted to highlight: derivatives of kernel and the weighted estimates. And these are again the important uh, sort of very key estimates for what we prove. So it's important for the analysis to work. So once you have this, I think I think I'm good on time. So I just wanted to say that I, I showed that to, in order to use Lorist, Lorist or you say learner uh, Ambrosi's result, one needs to know whether operator T is weak PP or not. And it's grand truncated maximal operator. Can you prove that it is of weak QQ of some type? So you remember we were assuming T to be of L2 boundedness, right? So that gives us for free weak 2 2. And we are able to prove with the help of kernel estimates, we are able to prove that the grand truncated maximal operators are point wise dominated by MP. Now, once you have point wise dominated by MP using the boundedness of MP and the weak boundedness of MP, we know that these are weak to do weak PB. So with this point wise domination, so the heart of the matter is to prove this point wise estimate and then we can use uh, uh, Lorist or learner Ombrosi's result to actually prove what I claim the sparse domination for the operator. So that would be the case for almost when you are going to two, but when you are in Q equal to one, we did assume L2, but I did present one slide saying that we can prove H1 L1. Right? And using that suitably, we can actually use operators boundedness not on L2, but rather on the good side towards one. And because the promise result is we have a spa, we have boundedness not just L2 onwards. Depending on how much decay you are giving me, I do want to come all the way to one. Okay? So these unweighted results help us to sort of go and to be able to use the machinery of Lorist. So that was pretty much all for this part. And I think I have at least five, seven minutes. Just five minutes. OK, I'll just at least say that there is some work that is in progress at the moment with Riju. So Kumanogo, Ching and Harmander in 70s, they actually gave examples of symbols. So you see this, I'm making it red. S Sigma Rho 1, operators of this type, which are unbounded on L2. So in the beginning I said that it's not necessarily true that if you give me just the L infinity boundedness, you see, even if you are giving me growth in X variable of high rate, then again I'm in trouble. So I did say that I'll not be giving, perhaps I will not be writing examples that L infinity Rn cross Rn is insufficient or of for L2. That being insufficient, I mean much more is insufficient. If you are allowing various derivatives to grow so much in X variable, then also forget about L2 boundedness. Now, around the same time, Nagase did show that a positive result by assuming in X variable. So basically, the failure is at X variable level. If you are giving me decay of too high, if you are giving, when you are taking derivative of MXJ in X variable and allowing growth of too high type, then there is problem. But then Nagase showed and then this was further strengthened by Kaufman Meyer that if you are not taking full one, but if you are taking kind of a holder type condition or moreover by some kind of Dini condition in X variable, you can get L2 boundedness. And these results motivated 
the work of Kenny Gistovet, and in fact, I read a lot of literature in their introduction. This motivated them to study what they call as rough symbols. By rough symbol, we mean that we are not demanding any kind of uh, derivative nature in X variable. We are taking derivatives in Xi variable for of many various orders, but otherwise in X variable, we are taking some kind of LP bounds. So let's say L infinity bound. OK, and if it is of this type. That's right. So this class certainly sits inside this. If you see carefully, if you are allowing derivative, then only growth comes right here. I'm not even looking at derivative, so that means all such are sitting inside. So the question is, I don't care. Maybe you are giving me derivative of much higher order. I don't want to use derivative, so I just don't want to work in in the kind of mean value theorems for X variables because many of the works actually require to be carefully using mean value theorem. That is that actually was hidden. If you see how grand truncated maximal operator was defined was the difference. So somewhere to make use of that difference, you would be invariably doing mean value a type of estimate fx minus fy is less than equal to derivative, right? If that is not allowed, then how does one deal? So let's take the same type of symbol. Just don't touch x variable, no derivatives. Then Kenny and Stoback proved that if you are giving me sigma, not just minus n one minus rho or minus n one minus rho by two, but you give me strictly negative. So you give me little more extra decay. So if you give me little more, so treat t equal to one or two, then it will look like familiar of Janilo Torchinsky or Kenny Gistobek, uh, uh, Stobek rule minus n one minus rho or minus n one minus rho by two. You take little more extra negative. If you give me that, we are in good shape. If you give me rough symbol with so much of decay, then depending on what P you are giving me, right? Accordingly, I will be getting boundedness on LQ above of P. And if you are giving me P equal to one, I not only get one to infinity, but I also get the L infinity boundedness. We get L1, one, one, not H1, L1. We get sharper L1, L1 and L infinity, L infinity. Now, this has motivated us to look at similar situation for more abstract situation. So anyway, following following this methodology, then Mikulowski, Rule, and Stoback studied uh, this kind of result, and they established exact. They studied exact same classes and prove what is proved here as unweighted result. They proved the weighted analogs. The same set of assumptions. They proved that pointwise you can dominate the operator by MP. So once you have pointwise domination by MP, you get your weighted boundedness, but the endpoint. So it will not give you boundedness at p p it will give weak right mp is weak pp so you have to still go back to the analysis to prove that endpoint pp but otherwise everything comes up for free not only just the unweighted but also the weighted boundedness now this has motivated us to write down same definition whatever we were doing for grusian symbols we just don't touch x variable we write down the same condition as we wrote for our purposes earlier oops And following the methodology methodology of Koenig and Stoback and Mikulowski Rule Stoback, this time uh, with Ruju, we have done for Grusian operator, and this is a work in progress. But we have essentially established the same result unweighted. If you take the same condition, then you get weighted boundedness, unweighted boundedness, and building on the same analysis, you get pointwise domination by MP. So except the endpoint, you get unweighted, but also weighted boundedness. And as I said, I mean like. There is a hope to go all the way to sort of a more general machinery and to be able to see things in more general setup, but maybe that's for future. Thank you very much. Any questions? Any questions? Yeah. This is about the classical uh, pseudo differential operator. No? So, what is known about LP LQ boundedness? They are works which I have not closely followed. And uh, so there are recent results of uh, Rujaniski and some of his collaborators, and they are writing it on graded Lie groups, 
which will anyway imply for RN because they work actually with the uh, uh, group Fourier transform. So, but a lot of these results they are also developing on multipliers rather than on uh, pseudo multipliers. So, I will have to really see. But there are for Euclidean. No, no, certainly on Euclidean there are results. I have not studied, but I am aware there are results. And in non Euclidean also there are recent developments that are going on. <coughs> Any other questions? So uh, there are recent results of Martini and uh, Maria, Gian Maria, oh, yeah, yeah. where they do instead of this Crucian operator, you have, uh, I mean, you have mod x squared, right? So instead of that, they have uh, some positive potential, some of, I think, positive potentials. So can your analysis be done okay. there? So I'll say the, so I'll, I'll say it. So this was something I wanted to write in the slide. <coughs> so one of the key ingredients, at least in the proof, are knowing or not knowing that the heat kernel derivatives have bounds. Now I'll come back to Grushin operator itself. Generally, the Grushin operator, various types that we see, the mod model ones, are minus Laplacian minus mod x to the power gamma del t square. If gamma is even, 2, 4, etc., then we have our results. But if even in that picture, if gamma is not even, the moment we lose that kind of smoothness, we just don't know whether heat kernel derivative has bounds or not, if at all, how it is proved, because I have looked at a lot of literature. And in this generality, the results are somewhat not known. So that is point number one. Point number two, because of the same issue. So how is it? So how does one actually, at least for mod x square, mod x power 4, how does one know the derivatives? Is to connect with Lie groups. Using the same connection, we write down this analog of uh, mean value theorem. What I was saying, fx minus fy modulus is less than or equal to the derivative times mod x minus y. This kind of notion also, we could write down a small lemma for such operators. Again, the notion requires that kind of uh, non-breaking of uh, smoothness at the level of operator because the gradient vector fields are important. Now that the moment we are losing that, we don't have any of these estimates. So this just totally fails. So unless we have the understanding of those things, proof does not work. Our proof requires these estimates of derivatives of heat kernel to build on derivatives of kernel estimates and the notion of uh, uh, mean value estimate. And unless there is a different methodology, this proof requires that, and in literature, I just could not see anything. In this paper, they have the sum of Vj and Xj. From X1 to Xj. No, so Vj they are, that they are taking, they are assuming, they are allowing it to perturbate. I am saying even explicit Vj x equal to mod x to the like mod xj to the power gamma, even that is failing for us. So the the very basic model there itself is something not we are unable to handle. We want to understand that, but so in some sense we know what how the proof works. We just don't have the proofs in between for the estimates. So unless one comes up either with the proof of those estimates or a new idea. Now, why there is a hope of rough singular? Do you take that extra negative? So that actually allows you to avoid any derivative estimates requirement. So that is helping me to believe that this result is possibly to be done. And that raises again the hope that if I'm able to develop that kind of post the endpoint, then these results should also hold. So it's believable a result, but I don't know what the proof is. And like seems to be pretty much out of our reach at the moment. With no hope at the moment. <laughs> Any more questions? Even from Online, any questions? Okay, so. Uh, okay, so uh, let us thank uh, uh, Rahul once more uh, for a nice talk. So we break for coffee now and come back in half an hour. We start at four o'clock. <laughs>